Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Learning Revolution series. I'm your host, Nagin Serafi, and I'm so excited today to be joined by not just one, but two incredible guest speakers, um, Sarah and Victor. I'll have you come on video. I'd love to introduce you to everyone here today. Um, we've got Sarah Lanka, Head of Strategy and Culture at Experience Institute, and Victor Saad, a CEO and founder of Experience Institute. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thanks Happy so much for having us. Okay, folks, I think um, I know the background story because we had a, an initial chat and it was really great to get your perspectives and understand the origin story of Experience Institute. But I'd love for you to share a little bit more about your individual backgrounds and how you came together uh, to build Experience Institute and, and, and why you built it. Cool. Yeah, I can get a start. And Sarah, you want to jump in? For sure. Cool. Yeah, so... Uh... Experience Institute had sort of a traditional, non-traditional founding story in that it got started because I had this need to um, re really rethink uh, learning for myself. Um, I was going to design, I was going to go into an MBA program at a local university, wanted to transition from working in, uh, in sort of the nonprofit space and to transition into more social enterprise businesses that were doing good and well. And then decided in the 11th hour that the cost of a traditional master's in the style wasn't for me. So I designed my own. It's a longer story, but it was 12 internships, mini internships in 12 months with 12 companies all in 2012, which was a leap year. I called it the leap year project, ended on the TED stage of talking about this amazing year of travel and work and learning, and then started helping, um, started the Experience Institute initially to help students go from college to career through experiences. And then I met all these amazing HR directors and learning leaders and realized that workplace learning was also in need of a redesign, um, PowerPoint presentations and, and typical uh, sort of, you know, workshops were pretty broken and boring and people wanted something different. So we started disrupting that space next. I'll pause there, but uh, that's the, that's the space. That's the quick version on my end. Yeah. Um, and then, and fun, fun part about that is now we're in our third rotation through a leap year. So we're celebrating our, our third, uh, our third, our third year of EI, which is really 12 years of EI. Yeah. Um, yeah. uh, yeah, my, my story has really some similar, some parallels. And when I think back about my first exposure to experiential learning was, was in college and, uh, I was invited to go on an immersive trip into Los Angeles, a city I just moved to from rural mid-America. And um, I remember over the course of those three days being profoundly impacted by the opportunity to learn about the city from actually being immersed in a place and hearing people who are working on some of the most acute challenges. And that really lit my interest in both project-based and experiential learning and found my way into a traditional classroom and thought these both proverbial and literal walls are just not going to do it for me. And so I need to go out and see how I can build a, a career in experience-based learning and um, have done that over the past couple of decades and was fortunate enough to come and team with Victor a couple of years ago, just during the pandemic to think about how do we bring that model of experiential learning that he had started with a leap year and started with bringing to the company in these short bite-sized learning experiences when we don't have the luxury of having four days adventuring through a city, but we have two hours with learners captured in a virtual environment. How do we still bring that same spirit in? Um, and that's been the thing, that the nut that we've been trying to crack and we've been making some progress at ever since. Yeah, that's right. I um I I love hearing the word experience based experiential because I feel like we're all yeah. very passionate about that. Um, yeah. Thanks so much for sharing kind of your journeys. Um, and also I feel like we could deep dive just into like how you got to this place in the first place. This this twelve um, internships thing. I feel like I need to like deep dive into that with you, Victor, at some point. Um, yeah. The the model is really interesting, and we're at this school also very passionate about. Um, community, we call it community-based learning, but it's really like social learning, experience-based learning. Like how, what is it exactly? Like, how would you define it? And what have you seen be uh, really effective and transformative in terms of uh, helping people transform personally and professionally and also um, achieve their, their goals and learning outcomes? Yeah, I mean, big questions. Uh, you know, I think there's probably a two to a fork in the road we could go at this point, more personal growth and, and more community oriented. 
I can start with the community one if it's helpful, and then we can come back to the personal. But we really like to think about, um, we love Priya Parker's work and Art of Gathering and the idea of purpose. And I think in the experiential learning world, you start with a community and their challenge. Uh, and so, what, you know, that's a great starting point when you're thinking about designing experiential learning is, do I know the people who are going to be in this room? And what's the challenge that we're going to try to help them overcome? So we, des we designed sort of this process from there of what we would want to guide people through that creates an experience. Uh, so really immersing that community in the challenge and making sure their voices are heard at the beginning, and then going into theories that address that challenge, stories of that, of that theory coming to life opportunities for them to practice that theory in small bite-sized doses in a workshop or a sort of scrimmage like experience reflection on that and then how are they going to apply that in their own lives and work and that's where the leap comes in that's where they each person is trying to design here's how i need to apply this so it's they have agency they have the opportunity to make it their own and then from there there's that accountability and support as they're leaping and the new challenges surface. So um, that's that's sort of how we def define experiential learning and designing an experiential learning um, sort of workshop or program uh, is to get into those. And, and maybe Sarah, you can speak about the challenges we help people uh, face or, or whatever else comes to mind there, but. Yeah, I think you, you hit it, Victor. I would add to that there's this component of ensuring that what we're working on is really relevant to them. I think there's this, this uh, misnomer in the learning space that learning is extra learning takes away from versus adds yes. to. Totally. And so when we're both creating these, these experiences, it is about the challenge that they're collectively facing, but there's also an invitation to actually bring their real work into that space so that the learning space is additive and it actually helps them both learn these frameworks and these skills and, and wrestle with a challenge, but also they're they're making real progress on a project that they're working on while they're in that space. So it feels really connected to their day-to-day, -day, both in the application piece Victor's talking about, but also even in the work that they're bringing into the session to work on and connect with each other on too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah it seems call. like, oh, sorry, go ahead, Victor. No, no, I just, just applauding that. It's a great call out. It really feels to me like there's this kind of structure and journey, but within that, you as the individual are also like, it's not everybody's doing the exact same thing. Everyone's kind of also having their own experience while having kind of the group experience. And mm -hmm. I think that's what makes for transformation is that you are um, curating and, and, and designing the experience to be relevant and personalized to some extent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And we've really wrestled too with, um, you know, we started very much in person and then COVID happened. And when you're in person, experience becomes very clearly understood. You know, you're thinking about all five senses, everything from the invitation they get to join the workshop ahead of time to how they enter the space. What's what's what are they listening to? What are they, what are they smelling? What are they seeing? I mean, you, we got so nerdy about all this stuff. And then COVID. And so experiential learning takes a very different take, you know, or a very different sort of form and function when everyone's at home on a, behind a camera confined to, you know, some screen size and in the background has who knows what going on. Yeah. Okay. So in that moment, what, what does experience look like? And so something I was really passionate about engaging all five senses got really challenged. And at times we got creative, like bring up, a, a jar of peanut butter with you because we have this <laughs> exercise or whatever, you know, light a, a candle or incense, you know, for a certain kind of experience, or we do a lot of pen and paperwork today, we, even though you're on, on, on screen. But really what we notice is that what Sarah said around, um, making it relevant and the best way to make it relevant is to make sure their voices are heard. Mm -hmm. There's discussion opportunities for lots of real-time discussion around what's happening in their lives and work. And that the facilitator who's in the room is someone who doesn't just know the content, but has actually been either in their shoes or at least close enough to it to where they know what questions to ask or how the framework can be applied. Because a lot of facilitation today and a lot of teaching today ends up becoming regurgitation of somebody else's work. And that's not actually helpful. And it's sure as hell is not experiential. Um, it's, it's much more about the facilitator, but great experiences 
are about the learners. Um, and so I think that's that's what the, where the magic is, even in a virtual context. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's safe to say we're still all trying to figure out the Zoom virtual experience thing. Like I, I still feel like there's so much work to be done here. And um, I, I love that you mentioned that there was you were trying to engage the, the different senses in the beginning. And there's so much I think we're trying to do. And also like this world is going to change so much. The tools that we use in the next decade are going to sure. you know, I think yeah. just at the beginning stages of what gathering virtually is and the tools that we use. Um, I'm just curious because you've done the hybrid and you've, uh, you've done the in-person and you've done the virtual and you do some hybrid work, like what are some things that you can share, whether it's tips or learnings around, um, what works really well in person that also works well virtual and what works well virtually that might, you know, like what, like, what are the pros and cons and what are some things that they share in common? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's where we found a lot of our creative liberty is if we've created a, an exercise that is in person and we know it works well, the question is, how do we translate this to a virtual space and still leverage the power of this, this exercise? And, and some are obviously trickier than others, but I think the grounding philosophy that we always have is, is something that Victor mentioned at the beginning, which is the center of our entire design and experience, which is community. So in the first five minutes, how do we make sure that people connect with someone or a couple other people there on an individual level so that they immediately feel part of this conversation. And it's not this, this dynamic of, you know, the sage on the stage talking at them, but it's very much bringing their experiences and their, and their um, questions and challenges and curiosities into that space. So in terms of tips, um, if you're thinking about translating what works in person to, to virtual, I think it's just, it's like a good exercise is a good exercise. So if you know it works in one space, like how can you reimagine it in another space? We've been, you know, tangibly huge fans of, of like virtual workspaces that we can um, translate, you know, something that we might have somebody physically working on a wall with, with post-its and jotting things down in person. How do we recreate that experience virtually so that they can still, um, essentially work in a partnership or a collaboration and still view what the other person is doing. I think mm -hmm. that's been one of the hardest things. So much of our in-person experience is about me and Victor as partners talking and looking and referencing the same mind map, the same brainstorm. And then we're in a virtual space and, and we, how do we do that? So really using the tools that are in our, 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 you know, available to us to recreate those spaces have been helpful. Um, and certainly creating opportunities. I, I like the model of how do we both go deep and go wide in communities? So how do I immediately have one or two people that I feel like I can continue to connect back to um, that are following my journey, even if my journey is just through this two hour workshop? And then how do I also feel connected to the full collective of this learning community and in, in its form over the two hours? Anything you'd yeah. add, Victor? Yeah, well, and I, I, I think what we've also wrestled with at EI as we've transitioned from being like the company that sends students all over the world, uh, you know, that experience institute to the company that helps teams, you know, now work better together in this unconventional way is that there is the experience in our workshops, but really there's also this experience that's happening after our workshops and, and or maybe in between. And that experience is really the one um, I think that the, the first needs to support the second. Uh, and and if the first only like stops at the first, we've done our we've done our jobs poorly. Mm -hmm. And so the first and what I think Sarah's uh, getting at there is that in those collaborative moments is when people really begin to design their leaps, their their projects that they want to see happen in their lives and in their work and in their world. Because it's oftentimes going to happen with a colleague. It's going to happen with a team of people that are going to leave this call and then go back to their teams or go back to their Slack or go back to their, you know, their documents or whatever they're working on, their products, and, and go after it. And so what is the change that they're going to implement or try to implement over the following 48 hours, you know, week, two weeks before they come back with us? That is, that's the other experience or, you know, we kind of call it lower E capital E experience. It's a bit nerdy, but um, that, that experience is, is really the magic. And so that when they come back with us, what we're talking about at the beginning of our calls is like, oh man, that totally did not work. And it was, or, or like, OMG, finally a breakthrough. I, this thing happened 
in a way that I've never seen it happen before. And I'd always wanted it to happen that way. You know, my one-on-one -on -one with my, uh, someone I manage or, um, you know, the, the interview with the client, uh, or the, the sort of share out with the client was much more, you can just sense the empathy in that, in that conversation because of the template we, 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 uh, we implemented there or whatever it might be. So that is, that's really when I think about the magic, it's, that second workshop or this, you know, the moment they come back after they've done the experience. Mm -hmm. I'm really glad you touched on magic. I'm glad I'm not the one that brought it up because I feel like <laughs> I was in like the magical moment or the magical part of the experience. Yeah. Um, but I, I, that resonates with me so much. I think even um, uh, I previously co-founded a, a, a retreat kind of experience, which is like no phones, no work talk. Um, and you know, there was, there was like a, a journey that like was like a structured experience that people were, were going on. But then what we found was like the magical mo moments were happening in between mm -hmm. yeah. the planned moments and how important yeah. it is, whether it's from workshop to workshop or, you know, between a program and then what happens afterwards, but creating that spaciousness, I think it's almost like you're saying, here's the, here's the structure, here's the guidance, here's the journey, but then there's spaciousness in there to connect with one another, to have your own reflections, possibly collaborate with someone in ways that are completely yeah. planned that you folks didn't facilitate necessarily. Like there's the role of facilitation and then there's also the role of like letting go and allowing things to emerge. Yeah. Yeah. You, you have to trust the learner, which, which can be hard to do as, as a, as a professional who's trying to help people drive towards particular learning outcomes, right? You have yeah, to, yeah. like you're talking about, create the container and then trust that people are going to use that structure to go on their own journey. But, I mean, our educational system isn't set up that way, right? It's set up so rigid and so specific and so structured. So even as learners, teaching people how to learn is a skill in itself, which I think is something that we try to do in our in our programs too. It's not just, okay, we're going to drive you towards these particular learning goals or outcomes for this workshop on this topic today, but we're going to teach you this process so that next time you have a curiosity, you know the essentially the steps to take to investigate this new skill, this new framework, this new leap, um, and to, to pursue that on your own. Mm -hmm. um, I... Uh... I just started started reading a new book. I think the author's uh, Dave Trot, uh, his new book on creativity in the first chapter. It's, this is not an exam. Um, <laughs> and uh, and when when and he tells a great story about um, the founder of Motown Records. And I won't I won't spoil it, but I, I just love the the phrase. This is not an exam because we're all so used to trying to get an A on the exam. There's also there are a, a lot of a lot of these books around education. I, I, I'm going to butcher the other names that I've read over the past you know, ten years. But you know what I think a really good experience is is getting people out of exam mode and on like hike or blank canvas paint. You know and and really to find their own way of 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 doing their work in a way that is relevant cre and creative and innovative um and br it really brings them to life i mean when you see when people are trying to uh get an a how stressed they are but when you see when when people are trying to solve a problem and especially a problem they, they have permission to solve in their own way engagement goes way up you know when th the things that are firing in their brain are so different and are so new the connections that they begin to make and so what we what a good experience does i think is the latter not the former mm -hmm. yeah I, I couldn't agree more and i'm curious because you have this approach and, and i fully align like i feel like exams quizzes testing folks yeah. like who actually enjoys that and is it like truly effective but i am curious about how you measure the impact and the success of the program, like what are some of the metrics for both engagement and outcome that you measure if you're not, if you're not implementing like exams? Mm -hmm. We, um, we're looking at metrics and engagement on, on two levels. And the first one is just how was the experience for the learners? Um, did it leave them feeling energized? Did it leave them feeling like they had more time to practice something? Did it leave them feeling more connected to their colleagues? Those are really the three things that we're we're looking at on a case by case basis. 
And then um, our overall impact measurements, we we really we have we have uh, the benefit of being a little bit more boutique in the way that we approach our impacts and the way that we approach our our learning design. So when we sit down at the beginning of any project with any of our learning partners, we're really collaborating with them to to learn what they want the impact to be, which is going to be slightly different, even if they're getting the same learning journey. So even if we're bringing the same storytelling series into company A as in company B, they're probably going to want two different things out of their folks. So that knowing that at the beginning both allows us to dial up or dial down certain aspects of that learning experience for them and also helps our designers and facilitators know what we're trying to push people towards. So one set of our measurements always stays the same, right? It's just about that experience. And then the other part is really geared towards what does each learning partner want from this experience for their people. And we're tracking that, I mean, tangibly around both surveys, but also conversations, and then both in, in short-term measurement and then lo more long-term measurement as well. Yeah. And the other pieces, I think, in, in a lot of our programs, the ones that aren't uh, just the one-offs, but the ones we really love to run, which are somewhere between anywhere from a month to three months, with multiple touch points is that the last share out the last time we're together people are sharing their stories of the projects and the experiences that they designed what did they learn from them what did they try to accomplish uh who did they meet along the way what are they going to continue all that and in a way those stories are also a measurement and those are the, a lot of times what people are sinking their teeth into whether they're fellow colleagues or leadership teams they're they're seeing that the learning wasn't just a classroom thing. It wasn't just a Zoom thing. It wasn't just like a, a lot of talking heads, but people got to work and they tried things differently. And those stories end up being one of the things we measure. We're still trying to figure out the, effort, like the, the right way to capture that at mm -hmm. the very base level. It's just the number of people who tell a story and then look at the project they did and whether it's continuing on 60 days 90 days after if if it should or shouldn't you know so um so those are a couple of things that uh that go beyond the the traditional like exit forms that we that we try to assess um I, I like what you're talking about there, Victor, because it goes back to this like anti-exam mode, which is is not just like, all right, take this survey, let us know how you felt about it. But it's way harder to understand the impact when people are talking about it. And oftentimes also in that difficulty, more profound. Uh, we just ran one of these nights or these storytelling experiences or project reflections that Victor's talking about and someone halfway through the presentation sort of just stopped themselves and said, okay, this wasn't just head learning. This was soul learning. And I think that <laughs> moment, like that's not going to come out on a survey, right? It, it, that's yeah. going to come out in conversation and in those like live reflections. And so yeah. we not only really rely on those, those quantitative impact reports, which are really important to some of our clients for obvious reasons, but we as, as designers, and I would say in more of our philosophy as EI, rely on the stories that people are telling at the end and the reflections that they're sharing in the room, more of that, um, uh, that qualitative feedback. Yeah. It, it makes me think about like, you didn't mention these words exactly, but it feels like the, the learning process is actually like research discovery and then coming at the end of it and saying, here's what I, here's what I experienced, you know? And, yeah. um, when we had Seth Godin on, on, on the show, one of the things he said that I thought was really powerful is like, the learner's revelation. So you're saying story, but ultimately it's like, did they have a revelation at some point mm -hmm. on their journey? Yeah. And that yeah. even, no matter how big or small it is, it does change the trajectory of one's life and career. Um, yeah. And sometimes you don't even maybe realize the impact of it three, six months, a year down the line. And you're like, aha, this moment that I had in this program, like that's shifted everything for me. So um, mm -hmm. I just want to just also like, I really admire your approach to learning and in community building. I think it's mm. um, just rare. And I, and I think a lot of the people that are trying to do this right now will just really benefit from hearing just mm. both your practical advice, but also just these beautiful um, high level, you know, approaches and, and philosophies that I think are super powerful and that can be applied in different ways. Um, one of the things I'm curious about, because I think when you're designing learning experiences and community building experiences, there's just, you know, every group presents a different challenge, you know, even if it's the exact same experience, it's not the exact same group of people. So I'm curious about what some of the challenges that you faced in designing workshops and programs, what are the kind of some of the top ones that come to mind? And then what did you do to 
confront them, uh, move through them, transmute them, um, because I think I think you know folks would really appreciate hearing that. So just uh, to clarify, so that some of the challenging moments in, in learners in our in our programs. No, the challenging moments of like designing the program itself. Like we Got need it. to get to X outcome. How might we do that? And here, like, you know, what were some of the challenges and how have you learned to reiterate your programming design based on some of the learnings that you've mm -hmm. had over the years? I, I have an example top ahead, Victor, if you want me to take yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Wanna, yeah. Um, one of the, the buckets, if you will, that comes to mind is when our, we'll call them our project sponsor, the person who's bringing us in has a sense that the challenges or the direction they want to move their folks in is here. And then when you get in the space with the actual learners, you as a facilitator and hearing perhaps their feedback and um, what their their questions are and their curiosity, you realize is actually over here. So mm -hmm. as a business, we've been brought in to address this. And as learning designers and facilitators and people who really care about people, we want to address this. So I think one of the bigger challenges has been how do you bridge that gap in between, especially when you've worked in collaboration with a with a project sponsor to deliver a particular program that that promises specific outcomes. And I think what um, we we've, we've learned and what we encourage our facilitators to do is we hire incredible people. We trust our process. We trust the people that are on this team, and we also have a partner first approach. So. In those moments, in particular, a, a group that we just worked with that we came in and, and the the ask was um, the ask was really around developing specific leadership skills. But we went in, we realized like they don't even they don't even talk. They don't have a community. They're not connecting. Mm -hmm. So like before we even go into these leadership skills, we have to have this like de siloed leadership group. And so what what the challenge becomes is like how do you do both meaningfully? And I think what we found is both to trust the instincts and be able to adjust even in the moment on the fly and see like, how can we pull other exercises or other topics or other questions out um, in the moment to guide towards additional or, or shifted learning outcomes? And then also, how can we use learning? Uh, let me see if I can articulate this correctly. How can we use learning as a means to an alternate ends? So if I'm trying to get people to deeper, more deeply connect. I can't just put them in a room and say, all right, let's, let's have a conversation. Let's enjoy each other. I can, but it's probably not going to go as well. So how can I use meaningful opportunities to, to let's say we, in, in our case, we use, let's innovate on a challenge that this whole group is having. And we're going to have a workshop where we dissect all the challenges that we're feeling really acutely and make prototypes to address these. So two things happen there. One, they learned a process for hacking away at problems. And two, they actually enjoyed their time working together and had to work cross-departmentally. So I think to answer your question, Eugene, in, in, in one example is understanding that the challenge you come in with is not always going to be the challenge that presents in the room. And <clears throat> the solution to that is trusting your gut as an experienced designer and facilitator and, and understanding how you can bridge the gap between the two in the moment as well as perhaps even adjusting where, where the course of the program is going. Victor, yeah. you have any other examples? Um, I don't, I don't, I don't know if I have an example. I just, I just have not acknowledged that a lot of what's happening today in the learning space is Look, I get it. People have big ideas and big visions for tech products that are going to change how learning works. And what I keep seeing is that once someone develops that product, uh, is that every you know they have a they have a hammer, so everything becomes a nail. Mm -hmm. And and a lot of these learning leaders and HR directors, uh, you know, and they have they have huge mandates. They need tools to make their jobs a little bit easier. And I get it, you know. But when it comes to uh, company to company and colleague to colleague, team to team, department to department, there has to be a sense of of empathy before applying a solution or else the solution just falls. And you're seeing it again and again. Company X spends lots of money to like bring on, on board some program or a content library or whatever and expect that that's going to solve their learning need. And it doesn't because 
and even some of these, by the way, have live workshops tied to them. So, you know, it's engaging. It's a real person on the other end. And I can customize it. Like, but until somebody says, hey, I care about your team. I'm going to care enough, by the way, to actually, before we deliver anything, we're going to get to know them a little bit. And then we're going to come back and make sure that our content is relevant. Mm -hmm. Yes, it might not be a, you know, a scaled up tech platform. Um, but that combined with some technology, I think it goes a really long way to actually addressing the challenge in the room, as opposed to just either slapping a bandaid or spending a lot of money and then missing the mark entirely. Totally. Wow. That was, yeah, I, uh, it's almost like the, the thing behind the thing. Um, yeah. and also what you were saying, Sarah, around like, um, it feels like what people want or think they want versus what they need. And yeah. you are also like part, it seems like part of your job is like, what is this, what do we need here? What needs to happen here? Just by virtue of listening, you know, I think like yeah. the power of listening. And I think as you were both speaking, the thing that was coming up for me was around how much, um, learning with other people requires vulnerability and trust and humility. And ultimately, I think when we have that, the outcome of the thing we're trying to achieve either on a personal or on a group level, like that's not like, once we have that, I feel like solving the problems becomes easier. Yeah, that's right. And I think that's something that Sarah is really masterful at is, you know, that she's got this unique seat of handling our culture at EI and de designing and developing this sort of studio model here. But then in doing so is always trying to be aware of the culture of the client or the partner that we're teaming up with and exploring how are we, how is our program going to reinforce that? So she becomes this kind of amazing filter for, is this actually aligned with what the client needs um and or you know are we you know have we have we wrestled with that enough to to make sure that we're going to achieve something here that's going to be beneficial and long lasting um and if you don't have that kind of person on your team whatever whether you're doing tech or professional services in the learning space you're just going to miss the mark um mm -hmm. and, and you're you're yeah and and so it's just been it's been awesome to have that capacity and capability here of course. Sarah, I feel like I need to see you in action. I like, I want to <laughs> be on fly on the wall in one of the, the planning meetings. Um, yeah. when, when we had originally connected, you know, we, we really emphasize learner onboarding at Disco, like how important it is to understand who they are, what they want, what their needs are. And for you folks, it might be more of a, an organizational onboarding, but, um, and then we also talked about offboarding, like, that's also a thing. Like you don't have to be part of a community forever. So I'm, I, I'm just would love to hear more from both of you around your thoughts on effective onboarding and offboarding, um, because the transformation all, almost happens in the middle, but the beginning and the end is just as important to set the stage. So mm -hmm. uh, if you could share some of your experiences, that would be really helpful. Why don't I take on and you take off, Victor? Yeah. Does that work? <laughs> okay, we'll bookend it. Um, yeah, onboarding. I to I totally agree with what you're saying. I love thinking about the bookends. Obviously, the 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 meat of the sandwich or the the veg of the sandwich is really important, but also what's holding it together. And part of our structure for every experience is to always have um, always support our client with first just the comms and the buy in. Like I mentioned at the beginning, sometimes I think learning gets the rep of like, oh. I have to go do this thing or I'm required or whatnot. So we want to drive both excitement, but also understanding of the, the value add and the why, and that this is going to be different before the learner even gets in this space. And so um, we do that by, by really fitting within whatever communication structure our, our partners already have um, to make sure it's, it's not, it's infused in what they do, but also we write it so that it feels slightly disruptive or different from what they're typically used to hearing from um, leadership or their team leads or whomever they're getting most of their organizational communications from. So that's just an easy way to start to introduce people to what is this experience going to be and how is it going to be different. And then we always have, um, prior to the learning experience, some kind of pre thinking, pre-doing, uh, pre-reflection, pre-reading, something that's going to 
just turn their brain on to the topic or to the subject that we're going to be discussing. So those are the, the touch points that happen before someone gets in. And then, like I said, we, we treat that first like eight minutes of each workshop also as sort of the onboarding into the experience where they're immediately realizing like this isn't something that you're going to turn off your camera and do all your other work and then come over here and click yes or no or poll. Um, this is something that's going to only live if you bring your own experiences and opinions into it. And we show that quickly by getting their voices into the room as soon as possible. And then also connecting them both on that, that deep level. And then the wide level, like I talked about, and then Victor, you want to talk about off? Yeah. Um, I think about, uh, whenever I played soccer, I loved soccer and I was a goalie and I was, I started off as a super chubby kid who just didn't want to run and then fell in love with the position. Um, and I remember through high school and then in college, the first time I went to goalie camp, just what happened to my my play that rest of that season, you know, and and both in like, you know, act tactical kind of things, but then also the the people I saw on the field throughout the rest of the year, the coaches I got to know, all of that, and that you know led me into college and so on. And um, and I think about that experience of going back every summer and and sort of reconnecting with some of the same people and then and then leaving again and um, and growing each time. So I love the idea of offboarding in this kind of, okay, where are you going to go off into next? Go play for a while. But I think I think a really good, healthy learning culture has some of these on-ramps and off-ramps back into either similar programs or for similar sort of growth moments or transition moments in the life cycle of an employee. And so what are those, you know, sort of milestone programs? And I, as an organization, I want to be the, I want us to be that kind of uh, the, the partner who can help design those milestone experiences. And then eventually I think those are being led by uh, people who are in-house, you know, alumni of the program or coaching, a head of learning is maybe organizing a lot of the pieces that we've put into place and so on. Um, but I, I really like thinking about the learning cycle inside of a company, having these multiple onboards and offboards that from these, like during these growth moments in, in an employee's life cycle, uh, that's, that's where I think magic is and what, and where people get excited to go back because learning is connected to their growth in their career. Learning is, is a sign that I'm, I'm making progress. Um, it's not, it's not a chore. It's not a, it's not a, um, a, 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 yeah, it's not a must. It's a, it's a, it's a privilege and it's a chance to to take on my next sort of chapter. Um, so that's right. That's where I really like the idea of offboarding is when it's part of a larger system. Mm -hmm. And I'm, so I'm curious, do, do you have clients that come back, you know, a year later, two years later and, and want to like work with you again on a new, in a new way, in a new experience? Yeah, so the, today we have th like three, four main content areas. So we help managers go from you know zero to five in in a, in, a, in a manager sort of leaps program, if you will. We have an innovation sort of track that people can go uh, sort of tackle their most challenging products or changes in their industry together. Uh, and then we have storytelling, which is all about how do I write and then take the stage, right, and, and deliver presentations. And each of these things, again, are delivered in the style we've been talking about for the past 30 to 45 minutes. We have a larger program that is also um, for high potentials or for onboarding, which is just general leaps. Like, what are the things that you're really passionate about? And that's really used for engagement or for, again, for high potentials that want to take on something in their life and work. And so these programs are kind of the flagship programs we run. We can tailor and we can chop it up and we can do different things at different points, but we, we really love those four starting points uh, for a company. And so depending on what your needs are, if you have a crop of managers who you've had to promote, perfect, like, let's go. We've got something off, you know, off the shelf that we can start with and then do the research, tailor it, and we're off to the races. And, and then maybe though the next year you have a real big innovation mandate and you're not sure where to start and you don't want to just take the innovation courses off the shelf or the whatever IDOU, no offense to IDOU, love IDOU, but whatever you, you want to create an experience and, and so on. So that way we can be um, sort of a partner that really does come in at these major milestones for either the company or specific teams and people. Yeah, I, I I love the term part, partner. I think you really like encapsulates what you do. Sorry, Sarah, go ahead. No, no, no. Uh, that's a good catch too. That's definitely 
we intentionally use that because that's how we feel, how we want to show up um, for folks. But I think the the cool part that that Victor's talking about is we can show up in a company or organization's life cycle in a, in a couple of ways. We have some that just use us for the same programs and they put the new cohort through every six months or every year. Um, and then we have others that we started in this really narrow lane. And then they're like, wait, do you also do this? Or could you also do this? Right. So yeah. then we become like this, uh, all these tributaries of projects within them. And we love both, but I will say the the value, I guess of either, but I was thinking primarily of the tributary is that when we are able to embed ourselves in a company in one way, then we get to learn their, the way that they work, the lexicon that's uh, you know immediately valuable yeah. to them, the way they interact, what they value. And we we take that knowledge into a different team, and oftentimes it teams like, how do you know all this about us? You're out, you're <laughs> yeah. outside, you know. And so we love that because we feel embedded in the yes. culture and in the spirit, yeah. um, and who they are, and we feel like that's it. That's a really big value add for them too. Yeah, you become Told part you. of the team essentially. Yeah, we, we <laughs> like say we're I'm, like an extension of your learning. Team. Exactly. You know, just think of it exactly. as a, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we can we know we can kind of tell you what to do a little bit because we're like yeah. on the outside. I, I think exactly. it's such an important yeah. role to play. Um, yeah. as we're kind of wrapping up, uh, the world is changing rapidly, and just. I, I cannot imagine what the the world of learning alone, but also online learning is going to look like in the next decade. So I'm curious. Yeah. I always ask this question at the end um, because we're all shaping it together. You know, we're co-creating the future. Uh, where do you see the the future of learning, uh, learning together, and also the intersection of learning and work going um, in the next five to ten years? Or maybe what's Ooh. your highest hope? <laughs> uh, well. Uh... <laughs> It's a Holograms. great question. <laughs> um, you know, I'll speak to two things that I think it's, it's going to be really clear. Uh, so one, there's going to be so many more transitions. We thought, we thought, you know, the 30 year career was over 10 years ago. It is, it is now getting, going to get chopped up even more. You're, you're the number of things you're going to need to learn to do, can do transition into doing, the jobs that don't even exist yet that you will have to get upskilled for. It's just wild, you know? So I think everyone just get ready for that. Uh, it, and you're going to have more resources at your fingertips to learn how to do those new jobs. And then the other thing, which I, I mean, maybe this is very self-serving, but I do think that time together of learning, discussion, looking someone in the eye, uh, having a moment of problem solving at a whiteboard or at a table or at, you know in the lab or whatever it might be, all that is the value of that is just gonna go through the roof. Um, and the number of people who, who can actually facilitate that kind of thing and create those magical moments that I think you're also really great at, Nijin, is, is just gonna be so, so special and for keeping teams together, connected, growing, and for people to be healthy. Uh, not um, through throughout all the change ahead. I'm on board for that vision. I um, what would I add? I think um, <laughs> I mean every day I'm reading of like new terminology in the workforce I didn't even know about you know last week, and so I think um, one thing that's become really clear to me is is a variation of what Victor's talking about of like there's just less. Um, like less allegiance, I think, to the the employee has to the employer. And I think the employer is going to have to really work hard on culture building and senses of an, and building a sense of belonging for people. And like I said earlier about just having two different outcomes you're driving towards, I really think learning is going to be one of the key ways to do that. Because happy hours and escape rooms and all that, they're, they're fun things to like bond people, but it's not it's not meaningful. It doesn't get to that deeper level. And so I think learning can really step in for some of those bigger complex challenges. Like how do we get our people to work together well? How do we get people to be endeared to this organization? One of our biggest outcomes that we've had this year is uh, from some of our partners is hearing, I feel more invested in by my employer because of this program. And that's been a really important thing for some of our partners to, to be able to look back on and say, as that as we see that just on a on a workforce wide dipping uh that connection to to place of work i i couldn't agree more i think what you're touching on is um 
it's almost like the dynamics are shifting because the world is shifting and yeah. therefore we mm -hmm. must all shift alongside it. Um, yeah. Thank you both so much for, for being present with me during this conversation, for all the insights and wisdom. I hope it's not our last. I'll be knocking on your door to have more <laughs> conversations to continue to learn from you. Um, yeah. Thanks to everyone who joined live and everyone who's watching the recording. Um, really appreciate you both, Sarah and Victor. So thank you. Thank yeah, you, it's, Nadine. Uh, it's our joy and uh, we're looking forward to continuing to watch Disco's growth as well and, and sending you our best. Thank yeah. you. Have a great day, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.